All right, let me introduce this again. Uh, this is a this is a Ford Taurus that was just brought in the school, and this person is waiting for it. It is something that I don't like to do. is is someone who's waiting because my number one job for you guys is to teach class, uh, not handle an outside customer that has a misfire and has to get their kid at daycare at 12:30, and it's now. 10 o'clock. So I'm making the best of it. That's why we're filming it. The camera is on and so we can use this as a training exercise and we're going to treat this like we did uh, your car, Austin, when we did the field trip and you have a misfire and, and let's just attack this thing and let's see if we can do it as quickly as possible. Maybe I don't go through all of the steps and procedures that we can do. We could spend a lot of time on this car. Um, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Let's just just start from square one and, and uh, see where this leads us. I have the key on and I've connected the scan tool. I haven't gone any further. We haven't even identified the vehicle yet. Okay? So we are going to our scan tool first. Right? I want to see what cylinder specific uh, misfires, if there are any, I want to see if we have that. So it's a Ford. That should be us. Press OK. I want to, I don't want to retrieve all memory codes. That's going to read airbag and anti-theft and temperature control and anti-lock. I just want my engine automatic with air conditioning. Go to my codes menu. I want my memory codes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, la I'm laughing because because this is why this is why we don't do waiters. I, I mean, maybe it's something easy. Uh, Nick, when you drove it in, you said you felt a constant misfire, and so we may be able to uh, do a cylinder drop test with a test light and isolate what cylinder it is. You know, we have multi-cylinder misfires here. Um, I don't like that both up, uh, upstream O2s are indicating lean. I don't like that at all. System too lean. I don't like these ones. The EVAP system, I don't care about at all right now. Okay? Uh, an EVAP leak code, separate issue. Uh, should be able to scroll the rest of these misfires. So, one, two, and five, one, two, five, and six. Uh, and then the engine mist detected on startup, the 316, just kind of a generic misfire code, too. So not great direction here. We may have one of our cylinders that is actually uh, specific here. You know, when I do my RPM drop test, we might be able to see it. Um, I want to try something on Ford. <coughs> Ford offers a mode, and I haven't found this test to be very useful with the snap-on units. I, I hear a lot of guys talking about how great it is, but it's a power balance test the cylinder contribution test. This will be Ford that offers this. So what we're looking at is minus 32 and whatever that number is doesn't matter. The minus ones are your misfiring cylinders. What this is suggesting to us guys, this is suggesting that we have a constant miss on cylinder one. And so this is a pretty decent test as far as Ford goes in offering this to us. I want to warn you though, I haven't found much value in this test. Uh, I've used it a lot and every time I've tried to use it, um, it's, what? Six showed me some misses too? Okay. Um, what's the firing order on this vehicle? Can somebody look that up for me? Thank you. So cylinder six and then cylinder one, you see in the firing order, six is right next to one. Can you guys see that? Is it possible cylinder one is affecting the misfire monitor and, and flagging uh, cylinder six? It is. So the next step I want to do, guys, question, you good? I, I just want to do my, my test light one. Shut that off for a second, please. Turn the key right back on so I don't lose my data. <laughs> a little slow on the draw there, that's okay. Can you start that up for me? Guys, all I'm doing, just going to take my test light, an incandescent test light, by the way, and I'm just going to do a cylinder drop test. My uh, ground lead, I'll just go to the strut tower. And then one at a time. Hang on. Watch this one again. 
All right. Here the RPM changing. Okay, next one. Uh, nothing. Okay, nothing at all. In fact, I'm feeling brave. What do you think? <laughs> I think we found our misfire. All right, let's let's keep going. Hold on. So, I would I would be willing to bet. Yep, that's cylinder one right there. Next one. Good spark. Now listen for the change. Hear it? Next one. Good. Good. Okay, one last piece. I want you to see how far the spark jumps. I'm gonna probably get electrocuted or shocked. That electrode is way down inside, unlike uh, the GM Type 2 coil we did on our field trip. So that electrode is way in there and it doesn't look like it's jumping very far past the tower, but you need to understand that that is way inside there. So that's a good inch gap. All right, shut that off. Can I turn it on? No. What are you doing? Just trying to make it look like so you can read it. <laughs> is that bothering you? It bothers that it's upside down? It bothers Eric. He's got OCD like that. Eric. Cross. Does it? Yeah. So he's, he won it like the other way. Yeah. He's got that OCD shit. Is that better, Eric? Is that better? Yes. Huh? Better. <laughs> I, I I understand. It it takes it takes one to know one. <laughs> yeah, man, that was some serious OCD right there. I thought I was bad. All right, listen. I, yeah. Uh, that one wouldn't have bothered me. This, the oil cap was crooked and Eric couldn't concentrate because it was crooked. Hey, <laughs> I, 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 I'm with you, man. I have some weird quirks about me too. Okay, listen. <clears throat> listen carefully. This coil that we're looking at here, it's that tower, right, that is not contributing. The, the companion cylinders on this one, this is a waste spark. This will be a great follow-up, by the way, Austin, for yours. And what I'll do, I haven't posted... <coughs> that one that we just re recorded the other day. I'll probably post that one first and then this will be the follow-up to that because it really is is the same thing. A different car, different system, same thing we're dealing with. Okay. Um, the tower or the pairings on this is different than Austin's type. The GM Type 2 coils are three separate coils that sit on top of an ignition module. Okay. This one, it's one assembly. So this assembly uh, is all one unit but there are three coils inside of it. The one coil is this one here, the second one's this one, and the third one is this one. So given that we had spark here, okay, tells me <clears throat> that I'm done, I need a coil. If, if I didn't have spark on this one too, then I would have to check my controls coming in, okay? The controls for this you see the connector? You gonna see that okay? Mm -hmm. There are four wires. The red wire is a common feed, and then the three uh, other wires, the yellow, black, yellow, white, and yellow, red, are the three control wires for this engine computer system. So there is no module in this system. It is just the coil housing. Okay? Uh, real fast. I can't. You should be like, yeah, right, when I say real fast. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. There is nothing that I do that's real fast when it comes to troubleshooting. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> we we could we could expand on that topic, but we won't because there's cameras rolling. Huh? Yeah, but I'll I'll be tempted to leave it in there. Is the problem? Okay, uh, to compare these two, okay, to compare these two, meaning uh, Austin's Type Two system to what this Ford is, um, the 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 Type Two system. Uh, what what year was your Bonneville again? Uh, 2005. 2005. So your your ignition module sat here, and there were three different transistors that are inside of the module itself. <laughs> okay. And those transistors controlled the coils that sat right on top. So yours were individual, okay? And the uh, primary side of it would be a positive feed would come into the module, it would feed the module, and it would feed each of these coils. It'd have a winding, and then that winding would go to the transistor, okay? And what's the transistor doing? This is not this Ford. This is Austin's car. The, the transistors are going to ground, and so we're controlling the primary side of these coils, okay? You follow? Um, by these transistors that are in here. And then with information from the engine computer, cam and crank signals, this will be coming from the PCM, the computer's telling this ICM, this is my ignition control module, when to fire and for how long to fire these coils. You, get, you guys follow the design on Austin's. That is not this Ford. This Ford, the coil assembly, it has a, uh, a main feed. We'll draw the wiring up top just like it is. We have three, three yellow wires. You're probably not going to see that. Can you see the yellow okay? I don't know that the yellow will show up on that. We'll make the yellows blues. So internal design. Internal design would be three primary windings, which would be three separate coils, okay? And the blue circuits, which would be, in our case, um, uh, yellow on the car. These guys go here. This just a little loop too. I guess I didn't need to do that, but that's it. That's what's inside of this Ford. What is different about that design compared to Austin's? There's no transistors. That's the key with this whole thing. There are no transistors inside of this module. Where are those transistors? Yes. My transistors for this Ford are inside of the PCM itself. There is, no <coughs> there is no ignition module on this car. This is the PCM. These guys are going here. You follow? And then this red wire is going to a fuse externally fed. There's your circuit. That's just the primaries. I didn't draw the secondaries. Okay? Questions? Yes? Pull up and pull down, we apply to switch inputs. I want to uh, uh, not apply that here. In a sense, yes, I understand why you called it pull down because what we're doing, it's ground side switch. It's a low side driver. But with a low side driver, it is essentially pulling the voltage down, isn't it? And the reason I don't want to use that term is I don't want to get your inputs and outputs mixed up. That's the only reason, okay? You would be correct that it is pulling the circuit down. If I did voltage measurements on this, what I would see, let's say on, this is coil number one, right? The one that's not firing. If I did voltage measurements on the primary, I would see 12 volts in that location if I could get inside and I would see 12 volts in this location because the driver, it's on the ground side, the driver is not grounding yet, so we would actually see 12 volts all the way over to the computer. 
when the driver turns on, we ground the circuit, so this leg would drop then to zero, right, or zero, and, and the voltage would get pulled down, so I understand why you wanted to use that term. Do you guys understand why I don't want you to use that term? It's just simply this. Here's the reason. I don't want you mixing up your inputs and outputs in your mind. That's all. This is an output. We're controlling this circuit. We're not watching this circuit. Make sense? All right. The secondary of this coil is wound around the primary. And we'd have one tower that would sit here and the other tower that would sit here. The fact that I have spark in this location tells me what about my coil underneath that's making the magnetic field and collapsing the magnetic field. If I have spark here, I have spark coming out of this tower and nothing out of that one, how's my primary circuit? Would we have any spark at all from either tower if I had a primary circuit malfunction? No. So my driver's good, my computer's good, my feed is good to this ignition module, no reason to check it. There's other things that tell us that too. We have spark across the board and power fi uh, feed is, is shared between the three coils. No reason to do anything else. We're done, right? I wouldn't be asking that question if we were. There's one other thing we need to think of. We are done as far as my circuit tests go. We are done as far as there's no other need to, to connect a, a low amp probe or to connect a scope and check for control. Okay, we're done as far as that goes. But what I told you guys, what can, what can do this? When we talked about Austin's car, there's something that can cause this is what I'm looking for. Bad plug wire. Yes, a bad plug wire or a bad plug. And so um, if I'm in the field, I'm done. These are original spark plug wires. I know that because they're numbered, right? Unless you bought spark plug wires from Ford at some point in time. What's the mileage on this, uh, Brandon? It is 109,000 miles. So it's probably never had plugs. It's never had plug wires. An open, good question. A short in the plug wire will not, will not damage the coil because we give that energy somewhere to go, okay? But a open plug wire, an open, a high resistance plug wire is the one that will do this. <coughs> However, this is a Ford and I have seen these go bad just because. Uh, so I don't know what Ford did with this design, but this is actually a common fault. Um, I have a video where I showed a former class, the RPM drop test using a test light, and, and it is the same thing, uh, a, a bad coil. Uh, so I'll, for you guys watching this later, look at the description. I'll link that video too where I'm showing the RPM drop test on another Ford with the exact same problem. And that car did not have any issues with plugs or wires. She's waiting, right? Customer's waiting. You're in the field. How are we selling this job? It's getting an ignition coil, it's getting plugs, and it's getting wires. Are we done? <coughs> We're not done. How, we have to address what else we have in this car. We have two oxygen sensor fault codes, right? Lean condition codes on bank one and bank two. We also have EVAP codes. So if we're writing up this repair order for this customer, you need to understand that it is not a one diagnosis for all problems. Let me, let me get to the fault code screen. I want to show you how I would write this up and then we'll, we'll be done with this car. We could go further and we could put the amp probe on this and we could look at coil oscillations and we can, we can do all that, but it's really not necessary. Uh, turn the key on for me, please. EVAP leak. We, got, we have to write this stuff down. If I'm, I'm thinking of when I worked at Pet Boys and I, I wrote up my repair orders for what I'm doing. What is her main complaint, by the way? Her main complaint is my check engine light is flashing at me, right? And my car has low power. That's, she doesn't know it's a misfire. To us, it's a misfire, right? You guys understand that that's what we're addressing right here? Yeah. That, that it isn't that we have to fix all of these issues with one diagnostic fee. No way. It doesn't work like that. I'm not troubleshooting an EVAP leak as part of this diagnostic fee. In fact, when you're a rookie and you're first learning how to do this, 
How long does it take you to maybe do what we just did? A lot longer than what I showed you, right? So maybe it took, it took us five minutes to troubleshoot this. As a rookie, it might take you 45 minutes, maybe close to an hour. I'll wait till the chairs can stop squeaking. Get situated, stop with the chairs. Thank you. Um, what was the last thing I said? Okay, good, thank you. So 45 minutes to an hour, right? Possibly, to, to troubleshoot this circuit. As you get better and better at diagnostics, your time gets better, right? Should you still get paid for that hour it used to take you? Yes. Absolutely, it took maybe me five minutes to do this. I still want my hour. I paid my dues. Charge, right? knowledge, knowledge is what you're paying for now right all right so the rest of this I'm not handling for that hour diagnostic fee I'm selling the job so I would I would have got paid uh, 1.2 so somebody do the math for me 1.2 hours would have been my initial diagnosis we do need to go a little bit further with this though with our fuel trims I want to eyeball those that would be included in this first diagnostic fee from there plugs and wires that would probably be a two hour job doing plugs and wires so I just made you know 3.2 hours flat rate time and, and it's not going to take me that long to do it, right? I'm making money now. I'm happy. Uh, just kind of teaching you guys how to, how to make money in this field. Um, I kind of got uh, sidetracked there. I had another point I wanted to make, and I forget what it was. So I, my apologies. Um, writing it up would be needs and recommends. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to make a list. And, and my list, I'd split it in half like a little chart, I'd put needs and recommends, right? What do we need? We need an ignition coil and we need plugs and wires. I'm not putting that as recommend because that's potentially a cause of this coil failing uh, is an open plug wire. Now, could we take the number one plug wire and move it over to another cylinder and move that cylinder over to the number one, switch both ends and then do some further checks on the plug wire? Of course you could. You could also take the plug wire off and measure the resistance of the plug wire. You could do all of that, and, and there's all different methods. Problem with taking plug wires off that have been on there for a long time, you're going to break them. I'm not doing that. Needs, plugs and wires. All right? Um, and I'm going to write also, very clear here, guys. I'm going to write also, this will take care of our misfire fault codes. You follow? So what, what, am I get, what am I promising this customer with this repair? That I'm going to fix my cylinder 1, cylinder 2, cylinder 5, and cylinder 6 misfires as well as this P0316 code. I'm going to take care of these guys, right? How do we know these other cylinders are contributing? Could we have a compression problem? We could. We could have other issues. And maybe we do a cranking compression test real fast. Uh, in fact, let's do it. I'll just unplug the coil. How about cranking that over for me? Listen to the engine. Okay. What do you guys think, sound-wise? Sounds steady, right? Uh, so I'm not worried about compression. You guys see where we could get into trouble here if we sold plugs, wires, and a coil, and then maybe maybe cylinder five uh, has. Well, that's his companion, by the way. Number one cylinder. Number one cylinder's companion on Ford is number five. So, uh, you guys understand what I'm trying to say? That what if we had a cylinder with no compression, and you had um, sold hundreds of dollars in parts, only to find out that you're gonna have this misfire when you're done? So we got to have to be careful with that. Um, but that's how I'm writing this up, and then I'm saying. Uh, further time needed for the lean exhaust faults and the EVAP system. I'm not covering that. So in other words, we're not guaranteeing this customer that the check engine light isn't coming back on after this repair. You guys understand that? Yes, this vehicle has had a lack of maintenance for a while. No question, this EVAP code has been there for a while. Make sense? Yes. That's correct. I'm, I'm promising her that we're going to restore her power and that check engine light is going to stop flashing and these are the codes I'm addressing for uh, the, the repairs that we're saying that the car needs. And here's the other codes that are in memory. 
Why is this important to write down? When you guys work in a big chain like I did, it's a little different when you work for a mom and pop shop and you're the guy and there's another guy and everybody's communicating all the time. When you work in these big chain stores, you got morning shifts and afternoon shifts. And then you have weekend shifts and you're not always there. And the service writer that handled that car is not going to be there. There'll be a different guy. So what happens when you're not at work, okay, and the car comes back with a check engine light on with a different service writer and a different technician? <clears throat> it's a comeback. And they write it up as a comeback. And for a comeback at Pep Boys, they would take half of my diagnostic time, the 1.2, and they would pay the other technician. So they would take half of my time and pay the other guy. The other guy doesn't want to do it because he's only getting paid 0.6. And I'm pissed when I come into work because they took 0.6 off of me. Make sense? But they pull up the history. So this car comes back with a check engine light on and an EVAP code. But to the customer, it's the same check engine light. Right. If you didn't document that stuff, guess what? It is a comeback. It is a comeback. Right. You screwed yourself because you didn't document your repair order. Right. You document your repair order, you're, you're good. You're covered. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Sometimes a service manager or writer, this is some inside info here into our industry, he'll, he will want to make it a comeback. Why will he want to make it a comeback? Because he needs to pay the other technician, <clears throat> okay? And the company doesn't want to pay. <clears throat> the question is, who's paying? Is the company paying? Is the customer paying? Right? right? Or are we taking half the money off the technician and paying the other tech? For the service manager, the bottom line for him is what? That he makes right. the company money. Right. So what does the service manager by default want to do? Okay. He wants to screw you because it affects his bottom line. When, if you document this, <clears throat> you're covered, right? Whether he wants to, uh, however he wants to handle that, you guys are covered. And if you're there, you should be getting paid again. If he says, I'm not paying you, don't do it. no, no, no. You don't have to raise this thing, say, okay, no problem. You get on the phone and you go above his head. And then when corporate gets on the phone, they understand what's going on. They get on the phone with him and then they say, you're paying that. You're paying your technician. And then when he, ha this is legit, this happened. When he hangs up the phone, he says to you, well, we're both right, but I'm going to pay you anyway. Both right. That's what he says, but it, what's the interpretation of that? He's not wrong. He, he, the interpretation of that is he just got, reamed. he just got reamed, he's paying me, and that's coming out of his bottom line, he's not happy about it. This is the, this is the way this field works, okay? Document, point, document what you're doing, okay? One more piece, we'll let this go. Get her out of here. What is running out there? Uh, <laughs> a a lawnmower. Uh, Somebody's lawnmower. Sorry. That's okay. I was just wondering what. It sounded like a mini bike. I was just wondering who was riding a mini bike out in the out in the uh, shop. No, it's a Timmy Slavler again. Okay. It's okay. It's got a, it's got an engine in it, right? <laughs> All right, one more piece, one more piece, and then we'll then we'll wrap this up. So she just wanted to know what was wrong. She didn't want to fix it. Well, she, of course she wants it fixed. It's not going to be fixed. She's waiting. It's not going to be fixed today. Last I checked, my shirt doesn't say like Vance Auto Parts or Pep Boys. I'm going to just you know, well, I mean, make these parts appear like this and get them on the car and get her out of here by in an hour. I'm going to tell her what she needs. And, no, I'm not worried about that. My job, listen, my job for you guys, there's 27 of you in here. My job is for you. My, my, my focus is not to fix, um, I feel bad for her. It's not to fix her car. That's not my job. What is my job? My job is to teach you. If I go fix this car and make this my focus, it, it, who's it? whose detriment is it? It's yours. So I don't care about fixing this car right now. What I care about is we were able to diagnose it. I can tell her what she needs and she can take it somewhere else and have it done. Otherwise, she can bring it back and drop it off. Right? Not wait. We're, we're, this is not a garage. This is a school. Here's what we need to look at before we let this car go. System lean bank one and two and then my O2s indicating lean. These codes would be centralized around each other. Okay? I want to warn you, with a cylinder one misfire, 
A misfire is a false lien condition. So we could, we could say that bank one, uh, this code, this P0171 and this 1131 could be caused by our ignition malfunction. But what I don't like is bank two, you follow? All right, so start this up, let's look at our data. No, I did. Turn the key off, wait for a second, and then, then start it back up. O2s. We got a dead miss, so this analysis of fuel trim is going to be very uh, difficult. I want to look at short term and long term. Uh, let's customize this. Long-term trim on both banks, can you see it? 25%. Bank one is a lot more lean than bank two, and that's really our misfire. But what this is showing me is we potentially have a vacuum leak too on this motor. Raise your RPM, give me like 2,500. You see the, you guys see the drastic improvement in the long-term trim? This motor has a vacuum leak too. Follow that? Let it idle. There's more than just a misfire to this engine. See how quick that is once you have the theory behind you? So would this part, this would be business ethics here. Nice catch. Nice catch. Sh uh, no, don't shut the car off. We're going to lose our data. I want this running behind me. Um, look how lean that is. Look at the O2s right now. Flatlined on me. Um, snap the throttle once, do it again. All right, I just wanted to see the O2s react to that. So those are not faulty O2s, that's just some pretty crappy uh, condition here. Uh, business ethics is, do we want to go further with the initial diagnosis if we're charging this customer with the misfire uh, for this lean condition? And for me, the answer is yes. Because we only spent five minutes figuring out we have a bad coil how much longer does it take to grab some water and dump it on the intake and find your vacuum leak? I mean, that's essentially what we would do. Or we could put a smoke machine on the car. Um, I think it's something that maybe we should do real quick. Let me grab a, a water bottle. Yeah. Um, do we have one? Yeah. Uh, here, wait. All right, I'm just doing it. Uh, I don't have much water. Anybody want to contribute to the cause? Can I have that? I'll buy you one. Okay. Um, the water test, right? All right. There it is. Right here. Right there. Right there. Right there. You hear it? Here, let me get. I want to make sure that this shows up. I'm going I'm to move my mic over to it. I mean, you're not going to hear it any better, but it will in the video. Are we winning? You guys, you guys uh, hear the cash register? Cha-ching. You should have heard that. I heard it. There's more repairs. Can you hear that? Yeah. 
cracked right on the back, right here. Right where my hand is. So, if I cover that. Let me get a piece of that duct tape. Here's what I want to do, guys. I want to show you your data real quick. Watch. What's the first thing that's going to happen if we if we fix this vacuum leak? What's the first thing that happens? My O2s are going to peg rich because my memory is is saying to add fuel. Look at the short term counting up to. That's going to change these long-term numbers. It looks, it looks like they changed. Good catch. Okay, I don't know if this is going to work. I'm going to try it. Um, something changed here with where we are. Guys, do you see the long-terms kind of bouncing around? And the reason it is, our RPM is not very stable right now. Um, but what we're going to see is just what you guys said. I'm going to see my... Uh, O2s are going to go rich and short term is going to go very negative when I plug this, if, if I fix this leak. I can't seal it. I can't seal it as much as I need to. Uh, but you can see my minuses, that O2 went rich. This should change more. wasn't really effective. Oh, I broke it. I I completely broke the hose now. Now you can see the crack. I, I need to get a piece of hose on this before I let her take this car. The duct tape didn't work. Yeah, definitely. I want you guys to see the crack in the hose. Yeah, you can shut it off. Can you see the Can you see the split in the hose? See it now? That guy right there. And that PCV valve wasn't actually uh, down all the way, so I went, once I pushed it down, it, it totally split that hose. So we'll replace that piece of hose. Oh, this is so, if I break this one, we're screwed. Oh my goodness, it, it's so dry rotted. We're done. That's, that's not gonna work. You can't get well, it big enough, you can slide over. No, blade. it's so. It is. Cut it with a razor blade. No. It's so no. brittle. No, and this whole top piece is bad. I'm not touching this any further. <sighs> yep, we have an issue here now. Which is this? This is bad. She needs this whole elbow piece. That's a special hose. That is not something that's going to be done today. Uh, I just need electrical tape because I'm going to tape the crap out of it. This is not a fix, but this will get her out of here. She's going to have to go to Ford and get this piece. That is ugly. All right, start that back up. <clears throat> Slight improvement. See my short term's negative a little bit. <clears throat> um, 
it's not going to be perfect for the fix that I did which again is temporary and with that big fat vacuum hose on the one side where it gets narrow all of that needs to be replaced that needs to be done uh, through Ford you're not going to you're not going to doctor that or fix that with how dry rod and literally it's hard as a rock um, so the fix is duct tape and uh, we're done right uh, it needs that hose it needs an ignition coil plugs and wires will that take care of the O2 codes the lean conditions the misfires what are we left with most likely we're probably just left with the evap which is going to be our separate diagnostic fee make sense and I'm not promising guys this is this is important that we'll be done with this I am NOT promising this customer that these lean exhaust codes aren't going to come back that is a leak that I found there may be some other leaks this is where we're going to start make sense you don't have to troubleshoot everything all at once so, and at times we can do it in segments and that's how I would handle this one questions we good okay we'll get her out of here and then we'll do uh, your Toyota next just wanted to add a couple things to the end of this video as I re-watched it preparing it for you guys I realized I missed an opportunity to talk about a few more things number one I said there's a slight improvement in our fuel trim numbers as I was looking at bank one I could still see it was very lean looking at bank two you can see that it's fixed rich so this is more than a slight improvement and one of the reasons that bank one is still showing very lean is we have a dead misfire on one of the cylinders on that bank and so that misfire is causing a false lean condition that is why that O2 is still pegged lean so that's number one the second one I wanted to talk about was Ford's fuel trim relearn procedure it's very different than some other manufacturers where you see them relearn right away and so what we're looking at here is exactly that process you can see the bank 2 sensor 102 starting to switch now and we start seeing some fuel trim correction here that's taking place and one of the things with Ford's is a test drive is necessary to see the long-term fuel trim correct and also you may have to even reset them they don't correct the way say a General Motors vehicle would where we can see it happen right away but that's what we're looking at here is a correction in the fuel trim and we're also looking at bank one which is still lean from this misfire we're seeing a maximum of 60 millivolts on bank one and this final image is really just showing this process of relearning again and we can see the trim numbers have changed a little bit more and they're back to uh, causing the O2 to be full rich again because the memory was adding fuel for that major vacuum leak so again Ford fuel trim numbers a little bit difficult in the relearn process using them we're in the process of relearning bank one is still lean because of this misfire on that cylinder it's not an actual lean condition it is a false lean condition the oxygen in that cylinder that is not being consumed is being pushed down into the exhaust causing a lean O2 on bank one so that's the final wrap up for this I missed that with my class I wish I would have caught it and uh, I did see it in the edits at least for you guys thanks again guys I'll see you next time